a topic that I'm sure is everyone's favorite to talk about at children's birthday parties and family reunions, uh, which is privacy nihilism. Uh, so first a little about me beyond what Alyssa said. Uh, I'm a mysterious figure, <laughs> not really. Um, so I'm a, I'm a security engineer at Yahoo uh, by day, but I do not speak on behalf of them at this conference. Um, everything beyond this is my personal thoughts. Um, I'm a technology fellow at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. How many people have heard of EFF? <laughs> yes! Uh, how many people here donate to them? Yes! Uh, so you can donate more money to them. Um, <laughs> oh, I also, I also volunteer for tour, and that's our official uniform, so that's a photo of me working on some tour bugs. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a really good Halloween costume. My friend carried around a bag of onions all day in <laughs> <laughs> In case you guys don't have a costume yet, which I know. Um, so something I've heard people say today, and basically you know, the past few years, is privacy is dead. Often this is the thing that comes at the end of your black hat talk. You're like, oh, I found this like, cash timing attack. I can go like, get your browser history. TLDR, privacy is dead. Uh, so <laughs> I want to I begin with that because a lot of people here probably think it's true. And if you think it's true, you actually have a pretty pretty good argument. Um, you guys heard about Ashley Madison. This is like the fifth presentation that mentioned the Ashley Madison. Um, but basically, people's data was breached and that data was quite embarrassing to a lot of people because it revealed that they were cheating on their um, significant others. And so, so this is sort of a turning point because it means people are finally think people are finally realizing that anything you put online, even if it's supposedly private, will someday be public. That includes your Facebook post and God forbid Black Journal. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean I mean you don't even have to be a hacker to really find out more about people than you really should be able to find out. Um, so I, I asked my friends, like, can someone volunteer to let me like, kind of dox you for a day or, or like, you know, as long as I want? And so I know a lot of people volunteered because they were just curious to know how much information about them is online. Um, so this is my a friend which we'll, we'll call Ben. Um, so Ben's a web developer in San Francisco. He's pretty technologically savvy. He started like five companies and he, um, he's always working on a new startup and he will describe himself as someone who's pretty conscious about security. Uh, so I, I know Ben's real name and so um, I also found his email, like it's just on his GitHub page. And from there, uh, I could look up what domains, um, well I also know, know the name of some of the startups. So I looked up domains he registered and who is and it turns out he had been just using his like real address and real phone number, right? Um, so from there, I got his personal phone number, um, I got an address, which I looked, looked up, here's a lovely picture of his, his house, uh, and with a little Googling, I found out that was his like, mom's real address, um, and his family home and all that. So, so a lot of us, even if we're privacy conscious, you know, our, our mom's address is on the internet, and people can find out about us. Awesome. Privacy is that. Um, and beyond that, um, <laughs> surveillers are going to surveil, right? Uh, so this is 2015. Um, back in 2013, how many people even remember 2013? That's like 10 years ago. This slide came out and people freaked out because a lot of companies that we work for are on the top. So Snowden said, okay, like look at, look at this. This is an NSA slide that shows that companies have been colluding with the NSA to turn over your data. So data that you thought was private to Google, Yahoo, well, maybe not Yahoo, uh, <laughs> Gmail, Facebook, etc has actually been shared uh, secretly with the NSA. And of course, some people suspected this, right? Um, oh yeah, Katy Perry released an album based on, based on prison. I didn't realize that until I was Googling and Google researching. Um, I didn't know Snowden had such a wide-ranging um, like effect on pop culture and so forth. Right. And beyond this collusion with companies, um, NSA, their Snowden leaks revealed a lot of NSA wiretapping techniques. So this is a slide from X Keyscore, which is basically the NSA saying like, wow, we love HTTP unencrypted traffic because we can just sniff it up. And once we sniff it, we put it into this like really kind of like Windows 95 looking user interface. Uh, I don't know why, <laughs> like they wouldn't spend their billions of dollars making that look a little nicer, but, uh, but it, you know, you can do search queries and get all this nice metadata about what, who people are emailing. And so Glenn Greenwald says this basically like 
allows the NSA to find out everything you're doing on the internet based on HTTP client server activity. That's pretty scary. Oh, and it, gets, and it gets, actually gets even scarier. So how many people have heard of Quantum? It's a little less well-known slide. Uh, basically, basically, Quantum is where um, there's a target that the NSA wants to infect with malware. So they, uh, they identify that target by using um, identifiers that are going over the internet in HTTP, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And by beating the response time from the original server that you're trying to talk to, the NSA can infect you with malware because they're like they're hitting you first before you actually reach Yahoo. I think Yahoo's web times have improved since then, so maybe we're like we're beating the NSA. I don't know, <laughs> but it's a good slide because it has um, nice pictures. So the selectors they're using to identify people are cookies. <laughs> so <laughs> cookies like Hotmail cookies, Yahoo cookies, etc. You uh, use browser and hack. So, so this might look familiar to some of you because this is what people use for advertising and analytics. The things that you know you use to track people for advertising purposes is also being used by the NSA to track people who are infected with malware when you don't send them encrypted to your server. And that's pretty scary because cookies are cookies are weaponized now. You know. And so people, I think after the slide, people got more serious about setting the secure flag on HTTP cookies and moving sites to full HTTPS. So yeah, so that's, that's pretty bad. And so people might say, what, what's the point of caring, right? The NSA is so powerful. They've done so many bad things. Like there's nothing they can do that won't freak us out. There's no surprises anymore. And, oh, hey, it's a blank slide. That's very that realistic. Another blank slide. <laughs> Another one. That's nihilism. And that's the end. Um, but, no, actually, that's not the end. Um, that's the big end of my presentation. I didn't want to end on a bad note, but I could have. So, so this, um, I actually think not everything sucks. Always, maybe. <laughs> and here, and here's why. Here's why. So, in 2013 to 2014, um, people might not remember, but things things got better. So Facebook turned on secure browsing by default. This was big, right? This was right after the Snowden revelations in June. Um, in late July, Facebook said, we're gonna use HTTP as by default for all users. So that was the first thing we had to cheer about, or one of the first things. And soon after that, Google said, um, we're gonna move search entirely to HTTPS. So suddenly we started seeing like large internet companies doing um, the H like being more uh, HTTPS. And um, this is reflected a bit in the Encrypt the Web report. Um, many of you have probably seen this, but I started interning at EFF when the, when the first one of these came out, and we've been updating it every, um, every year and so forth. So in November 2013, um, there was a, like, it's, it's kind of hard to see, actually. I realize now looking at this, this is a very good graphic. But basically, more companies started moving to using HTTPS between data centers and uh, HTTPS strip transport security after 2013. We we're still seeing more companies move uh, to, to these things. So um, does, does, did anyone actually see this report when it came out in 2013? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I saw it, and, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, Wired published this, this article that said encrypted web traffic has actually more than doubled since the NSA revelations. Um, what date was this? was this? Okay, so this was May 2014, about a year after Snowden first came out with PRISM. And, and this is what it said in the report if you read it. It said that in North America, um, it went up from 2.2 to 3.8%. 3 in Europe, it went from like 1 to 6. And Latin America actually went from 1.8 to 10. Um, and so this got cited a lot because this was quite surprising to people that it had gone up by such a large fraction since Snowden. <coughs> so I actually, read, I actually read the primary source, which is like behind the login wall, so I guess many people didn't read it. And I, I found out this report's probably completely wrong. <laughs> um, and here's why. So if you actually download the report, it looks like this. So it, lists, um, it breaks down traffic by the application type, such as Netflix, Google, YouTube, uh, Facebook, etc. And then it has this category for SSL. So someone at Wired or whoever read the report interpreted SSL as all the SSL traffic on the internet. But that's, a, that's actually an underestimate because some of you know, YouTube's traffic and, 
and Facebook and, and most of BitTorrent are all HTTPS. Um, so that that was a that was something people don't realize when they interpreted this data, right? And so, um, so the company that made this report, Sandmean, actually did a study this year of what percentage of traffic was encrypted. So they're kind of like an ISV um, company, so they have access to this stuff. And this is what they actually found in North America. Um, in fact, about 30% of traffic is HTTPS across the board. Um, this is measured at like peak times or something like in a, in a sample. Um, but that's, that's a lot higher than 3%, right? So if you had thought encrypted traffic was only 3%, that's not true, it's actually more like 30%. Um, and and the, the big news this year was that Netflix is going to move to HTTPS by default. Uh, in large part because of um, performance improvements in uh, SSL on FreeBSD. Like there, my friend John and some other people worked on ways to make uh, like CPC faster in the kernel. And so Netflix is finally able to do HTTPS um, with good performance. And um, this internet company, Sandme, predicted the increase in encryption when um, Netflix will be HTTPS, and it is gigantic, right? It, like, they predict that by 2016, um, two thirds of the traffic on the internet will be HTTPS by volume, simply because Netflix has been moving over to HTTPS. So yeah, that's that's pretty good. You can watch movies, Netflix and chill or something. Um, <laughs> I think that's what that means. Um, anyway, so uh, so that's 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 the internet. That's the web. Um, people who uses email still. I know my coworker Jan really hates using email because. He doesn't reply to it, but I think most other people use email. And some people use PGP, as, as John just talked about, um, and some people earlier. So email, um, I'll, I'll skim over this quickly, but email transmission is mostly insecure um, in a way that isn't obvious to the end user. So in the browser, you have that nice little HTTPS icon, and when you see the lock, you're like, oh yay, my bank account and my Gmail are secure. But in email, you don't have a lock, right? And that's partly because email has has these many hops, um, and each hop can be encrypted or it can or it cannot be encrypted. Um, and so, in by default, it's not encrypted. And so, if you're on, if you have access to the network, you can just say "encrypt for password on port 25" and probably get some people's passwords because their email is just going over plain text. Um, so the way that you fix that is you can use start TLS, which is um, a mechanism for for one of these. Uh, transmission servers to say, hey, I support HTTPS, or sorry, TLS, how about you? And the other server is like, great, I support TLS too, let's upgrade to TLS. And even that, that's been going up quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, this graph doesn't go back to pre-Snowden, so Google only started publishing their transparency report in um, late, late 2013. But you can see there's this huge spike in the amount of um, TLS encrypted email as seen by Google, both inbound and outbound. And that went up pretty much until the end of 2014, and it's been, it's been kind of flattening out, but still increasing. And that's good. And largely that's because big providers like Yahoo and a few others said, we're going to use start TLS for everything. So now email is harder to surveil on. Well, it's kind of harder to surveil on, so my friend Chris Palmer calls this sort of encryption encryption. <laughs> which I think is a bit harsh, but I also think it's funny. Um, so, like, I, I did a little telnet demo um, and screenshotted it. Basically, when I connect to my server on port 25, I can say, um, hey, server, do you support start TLS? And my server on the, this is on the left, my server says yes, and then I say yes, and we're good to go. But on the right hand side, um, imagine an attacker now who's like man in the middle in the situation on the left hand side. Um, on the right hand side, an attacker strips out the start TLS, and then uh, the server is like, okay, that sounds good too. And so the email gets sent in plain text anyway. So all you have to do is, if you're a man in the middle, is you just strip out the start TLS messages, and an email just gets sent in plain text anyway. So NSA could be doing that, um, attackers could be doing that. Well, okay, so on the right side, we have had some wins in the policy dimension. Um, how many people here live in California? <laughs> Quite a few, right? Um, you heard about Cal, Ecta, Cal you probably heard about Cal ECPA? Yes. Yeah, so this is an awesome win um, if you live in California. 
It means that law enforcement must get a must get a warrant to search your phone records and emails and so forth. Yay! Um, the only other states that have this, I think, are Maine and Utah. Sorry, New York. <laughs> Hopefully, it sets a precedent for more states to go with this. And also, Safe Harbor. Uh, Safe Harbor was pulled down. It turns out it's also a book by Daniel Steele. Um, he's a very, very famous author who lives in San Francisco. But anyway, Safe Harbor. Uh, means that European data is subject to better protection now because it can't easily be transferred to American servers, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which don't have as good data protection. Okay, um, so this is going to be an emotional roller coaster of a talk. We're going to like, reach the high point, now we're going to go down again and um, talk about why things still kind of suck. Um, so Snowden revelations are actually still coming out. Like people might have thought, oh, they ended in 2013, but no. Like there's there's still more stuff, and it's it's mostly kind of sad. Uh, so you know, perhaps it's not surprising anymore because we've kind of reached a point where we got used to everything, and now we're like uh, private. Like nothing the NSA does can surprise us. But um, but recently in a BBC interview, he says that the government has this program to. Um, hack into people's phones and listening to what uh, listening to what you're saying by using your microphone, seeing files, uh, using the camera, even remotely turning your phone on and off. Um, and he made it sound as if this was uh, quite easy for the government to do if you were a target. And so they want, you know, es essentially they want to own your phone instead of you in order to spy on you. And because people use phones so much, as, as John pointed out, that's um, a really great way to spy on people. Um, yeah, so, so this kind of gets in, um, into, into the debate of like, who, like how do, do people actually own their devices and what's going on? And, and I, see, I see a little bit of this echoed on the web. Because in 1995, not that I was using the web then, but some people were. <laughs> like Rob, oh, sorry, Ron. Um, uh, in 1995, websites look like this. Like, there's a header and there's content, and you kind of, kind of read the content and have a good time. In 2015, uh, websites kind of look like this. Like, I think this is a template people start with when they want to make a website now. Uh, so they have like this flash banner, and it's like clipped, to, like you know, it infects you with malware as soon as the page loads. And then there's this like branding, and then there's like a billion gigabytes of ads loaded, and then like a bunch of more ads on the side, and so forth. And so this has caused kind of, like people to people to want use ad blockers, right? Um, and Privacy Factory, which uh, I worked on at EFF in the past, is one example. <laughs> and this is the uh, international, sorry, I forgot what the I stands for, International Advertising Bureau's website. And even they were using a ton of third party trackers, right? Um, and then ad blockers can get sold too. I know people don't know who, like, um, this popular extension called Adblock got sold recently, and no one knows who bought it. Adblock lost it. Adblock plus it. Oh, sorry. I mean, this is out of date. That's not confirmed, but all the evidence points that way. Okay, cool. So, so speculation says Adblock plus. Yeah, but Adblock, Adblock plus is what they're going to do is you know, have Adblock plus makes money, right? Yeah, so they have these like sponsored, like, like right. permitted ads, right? Exactly. Right. Um. So so yeah, like, and and the the whole unifying thread of all of this is user consent, right? Like users are not consenting to having ads thrown at them, and so they install ad blockers, but then the ad blockers get transferred to like different owners. And it's all quite quite complicated. Like, who owns who owns their devices? Like you, the NSA, advertisers. Where is where is control going on the web? Um, and and people see this as kind of a 1984 situation where governments are spying on you, and corporations and advertisers are spying on you. And in the end, people have um, are afraid to do things because they don't have power anymore. They're, they're being watched all the time. And so I, I think something we should think about is how do we get power from governments and corporations back to the users? Like what technologies can we build to help that? Because the, the power shift right now is very, very unbalanced. Um, but, but there are obstacles. So how many people have read another book, Brave New World? Right? Um, and in many ways, I find Brave New World scarier and more relevant than 1984. And this is why. Um, so an excerpt from a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, so Orwell says we'll be overcome by an externally imposed impression. And th there, think about NSA, think about GCHQ, think about advertisers um, and, and corporations. But in Huxley's vision, there's actually no big brother required to deprive people of autonomy, maturity, and history. 
people start to love their oppression because it's convenient, because it lets them get things for free, because it, um, it, it gives them convenient to undo their capacities to think. Uh, this is probably a bit too grim, but I, I think the gist of it is there. Um, if we don't start caring about uh, the ability to think and the ability to control our devices, then we are losing. Um, and that, that perhaps is a bigger threat than the NSA mass surveillance, right? It's just that people perhaps will stop caring because they're, um, they become not realistic. But um, on the right side, Snowden says we can look at cat pictures and we should do that until things get better. So that's it. Other questions? First question for Jan. Uh, why don't you choose who you want? Oh, sure. I'll have some in the front. What did you think the NSA did before Snowden? Uh, uh, I think, what do you mean what they did? What did you think? Oh, what, oh sorry, I didn't understand the question. What did I think the NSA did before Snowden? Um, to be honest, I was um, I kind of entered the whole like privacy activism um, uh, community right as the Snowden leaks happened. I think I, like many people, I had a suspicion that the that surveillance was happening, but we didn't. I, I like would have not imagined the scale at which um, Snowden revealed. Like I would have not thought that the NSA could arbitrarily hack into any phone and turn on the microphone, for instance, um, or that they were using cookies to like target people. And, and implant malware. So some of it was surprising, some of it was not. Yeah, yeah uh, what do you think uh, the integrity of stuff coming from Snowden these days is? Uh, it's been so long and there's no third party to escrow the stuff that what stops him or the reporters from injecting their own scary tales to spin some, some yarn? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not a reporter. I would leave that question to someone else because I don't know. How. Well, just your opinion on that, like that, uh, of the big brother concept, right? Like they're trying to play big brother all of a sudden to guide things in their direction. Not to say that things are false, but that they could slip things in. Yeah. Um, on, I, on, the, on the subject of Grimm, right? Yeah, I, I think that seems unlikely because, I mean, yeah, if there was something that were really um, far-fetched in any of the slides, um, I, I think that would be a more convincing uh, scenario. But as far as I know, all the slides are um, technologically consistent with what we know about cryptography and, and um, NSA's ability to do things like that. Yeah. Um, in terms of your comments about people not caring any longer, uh, I think that clearly doesn't fall in that year to this crap. But what do you say to the average person, just my friends who are tech people, um, when I tell them they should care about this, and they're kind of like, well, what do I have to hide? Um, Ooh. I <laughs> that's, that's a good, uh, so I think that's a great point. Um, and many of you have seen the John Oliver Snowden interview where he goes, I actually thought about replicating this, but like, I really hate going to Times Square. But John Oliver, who hates going to Times Square slightly less than me, um, went and randomly interviewed people and said, who is Snowden? Like, what do you think about privacy? And they were all like, oh, we don't know who Snowden is, or like, maybe he's Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks guy. Uh, a lot of people thought he was Julian Assange. Uh, but when, but when um, John Oliver said, well, what, what would you say if I said that NSA could see your dick pics? People freaked out, right? Because that was something that was immediately very scary to them. Um, so perhaps we just, like, we, we're kind of, you know, like, it's safe to say most of us are kind of in a bubble of people who, like, know about tech and, and know what these issues, the consequences of these issues. Perhaps we just need to reframe it in language, like, oh, like, people can see your Snapchats, right? And make, make something very visceral and scary. I don't know. Hey, just wanted to give a shout out to an EFF campaign, and uh, we're also working on it. SaveCrypto.org. Yeah, exactly. If you, yeah, yeah. Trying to get President Obama to come out in favor of uh, strong encryption formally. Yeah, uh, excellent. Thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, SaveCrypto.org. I think there are over 50,000 signatures right now. Yeah, we need to hit 100,000 in two and a half weeks. Cool. Yeah, everyone go and sign it. Sign it for us if you want to. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think most of us are, have a lot of problems with the bulk collection of, of just huge hoovering up of data that, you know, for example, the Verizon documents that Snowden first revealed showed. But how do you feel about the, the really targeted stuff against specific people? I mean, a lot of the stuff that's being exposed, 
is really scary, is only directed at specific, specific people. It's not used in bulk collection. Do you make a distinction with that? Uh, yeah, I think um, I think EFF makes a distinction about that very clearly, and I do too personally. Um, I think mass surveillance is the easy target to say, like we need to, we need to reform this because people agree that it's kind of disproportionate mm -hmm. um, relative to the benefits it provides. But but targeted surveillance, you're right. Like it's more likely to have a benefit um, right. with less privacy intrusion. Right, and I, I mean, hate to hog the time, but. Part of the problem I have was someone brought up the journalistic things. Part of the problems I have with, like, say, The Intercept and what Glenn Greenwald's writing is that he often writes a really scary headline yeah, about yeah. some scary thing the NSA yeah. is doing to you. But when you read the fine print, it's really only for targeted, targeted surveillance against specific individuals. Yeah. So there, there was an Intercept article that was about like iOS malware, and, yeah. and he made like the headline kind of made it sound like it was broad surveillance, but um, technically it sounded like it was very targeted. So I agree that sometimes it gets over over reported, perhaps. Uh, so sort of in the same line, um, uh, not, it's not only governments that are targeting individuals, and getting access to high-level individuals sometimes allows access to a broader audience. For example, if you're managing Yahoo security, um, then you're targeted by not necessarily the U.S. government, but other hackers, um, how do you feel uh, that tar targeted attacks can be thwarted? Or wh where do you feel it's at targeted attacks versus, for example, the, the uh, broader security or safety for the average user? Um, so, uh, are you asking like, how do you defend against targeted attacks? I'm wondering how you how you do you feel that it is possible? Are you nihilistic about defending against targeted attacks? Oh, so I I am not. Uh, I think I'm not as nihilistic as this presentation was. Uh, I, I think, yeah, so I think if you are, uh, if the NSA is throwing a lot of resources at you, they probably have a way to, um, to like, own your computer. Um, I think targeted, like very targeted attacks are hard to defend against. Yeah, uh, shall we take uh, one more question? Does that sound good, Joe? Sounds great. Sorry for the peer delay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just have a question, because uh, the way that I pitch Privacy Badger, which you work on, is not like, oh, this helps prevent the NSA from spying on you, but that this is why, you know, advertisements for Cat Fancy Magazine don't come up when I'm setting up the football night. Um, so how do you see privacy protections being woven into narratives that are less about hiding mm -hmm. your political activism and more about user experience and quality of just yeah, yeah. on the internet. That's good. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't think anyone pitches ad blockers these days as being like protection from NSA. That's, that's really just the side effect. Um, but like, so, so if you, I, I think a really cool thing to do would be to show people how much data is being, um, is being collected about them from advertising networks. And maybe like make an ad that just shows that. Right? I, I think people aren't aware that they're being um, what what the what the consequences of third party web tracking are. Um, so I think I, yeah, I, I think we are lacking in like concrete examples to show people. There was this one reporter who tried to um, I believe hide the fact that she was pregnant while browsing the web from the advertising networks as long as she could. And I think she did it, but it was really, really difficult. But just telling people that, like, yeah, if you're pregnant at the app, work, app networks, probably know, sometimes before you do, right, that might have an impact. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, before yeah. you do, right? Yeah. Uh, can we give a really big round of applause for you?